that it's no longer considered specialty. It's no longer considered the green show anymore. Well, that and so many, I mean, last year was the first year in many that it there was really an EV predominance. And it was almost like this year, all the unveilings had already been done. And now people are in the process of actually putting cars on the road. So there was really nothing new in that vein because it had all been there last year. So it kind of suggests, and I'm crossing fingers, that Detroit will be kind of cool because L.A. wasn't. Usually one gets it and the other one doesn't. (laughs) Well, I think it's time for us to take a little bit of a break while Ben turns on our recording because we do have Mr. Lutz on the line. And as soon as I get done reading our intros, then we will get going with our um... Q&A session started. Bob Lutz here. Hi, Bob. This is Michelle. This I'm conference read our, is being recorded. I'm going to read our intros for the show, and then we'll get busy with the interview. I thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's good to be here. Thanks. If you've just joined us, this is Open Line, our monthly automotive get-together. I'm Michelle Naranjo from autobytel.com. I'm joined by Chelsea Sexton from chelseasexton.com, Aaron Bragman, analyst extraordinaire from IHS, and... Mr. Bob Lutz, who is, I don't think that needs any explanation. We are thanking our streaming partners tonight, GM Inside News, GM Authority, RumbleStrip.net, and DC Auto Geek. If you want to join in the call, go to bit.ly forward slash open line. Look for the call instructions there. Um, While we're on the interview with Mr. Lutz, you can just dial star six, and we'll put you in a queue to ask your question directly to him. So thank you, Bob, for joining us. Yes, thank you. Nice to be here. We appreciate you coming on, and uh, it was also good of you to stop by first Saturday on uh, Saturday locally here in Ypsilanti to uh, sign some books. I actually got a book signed on Saturday oh, by, by Bob. Yeah, glad yeah. you did. Glad you did. Well, that, uh, actually, uh, the number of books was insufficient for all the people who wanted it. Who oh, really? Wanted it, which was a good sign. It was a considerable line. There were there was actually quite a number of people there. It was uh, it was a good time. So are you are you enjoying are you enjoying your latest retirement? <laughs> well, it's one of these where I ask myself how I ever had time to work full time because between the lecture circuit, book tour, consulting, board memberships, and so forth and so on, uh, I'm really 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 busy. <laughs> you keep the helicopter humming uh, back and forth, huh? Well. That actually doesn't get used too much anymore because uh, when I when I worked uh, at GM at the Warren Tech Center or downtown, I mean it was a reliable route and it was a it was a routine and it it often uh, favored the helicopter. But now I have sort of these random assignments and a, a lot of them involve airline travel to somewhere else. So the uh, helicopter, unfortunately, is often not an option. It's like actually, become sort of a pleasure instrument. We're actually getting a, a couple of people in the chat room who are saying that they're having a hard time hearing you. If you, it's possible to speak up just a little bit, that would be really yeah, helpful. Sure. Uh, is this better? That is better, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's a shame that it's not getting used as, as much as it, it once was. We were always, uh, I was always hoping to actually commute someday in, in, that, <laughs> in that same fashion. <laughs> But uh, you're actually serving on uh, a couple of other boards as well. I know you joined recently Via Motors. Yes, I did, yep. Uh, why Via? Is it the connection with GM's truck program? Well, um, initially not, no. It was um, an independent initiative that was born out of the fact that uh, Craig Higginson, who is the founder and the power behind Via, uh, was originally in negotiation with GM for the purchase of the Hummer brand. And uh, that ah. kind of fell apart at the last minute, and uh, he was, need- needless to say, disappointed because he'd spent quite a bit of money on it. And then uh, uh, GM said, well, would you like to convert uh, some full-size GM pickups to extended range electric vehicles? And he said, well, there might well be some interest there. So that's how that started. So it's uh, the, the program basically now is <clears throat> converting full-size GM pickups into vehicles that have the same properties as the Chevrolet Volt, namely sort of 40 miles, purely electric, and then a small gasoline engine serving as a generator to keep the battery, the battery powered up. But the reason this is even more attractive in the pickup world than in passenger cars is that so many utility companies and trade people 
uh, like the fact that when you drive the truck to the job site, and when you're on the job site, you've got 30 watts of electrical power that can come out of outlets on the truck, uh, 220, 110, uh, 24 volt, 16, uh, 12 volt, whatever you want, comes right out of the truck for as, as long as you've got battery and gasoline in the tank, you have a mobile power source wherever you go. Hmm. Now, didn't GM do something like that similar with a hybrid pickup before? Well, we had a hybrid pickup with a with I guess a 115 out. Ah, okay, right, right, but right. But there there was no sort of reserve capacity. You know, you had to keep the engine going. I gotcha. Yeah, there was the thing with the Hummer. I remember. Um, at the end of the days, because I used to work with Rod Hall on, on the Hummer racing program, um, that they were talking about these Hummers that would actually be able to go into a disaster situation and power entire hospitals. Yeah, that, and that was, that was Craig Higginson's vision when he founded Via Motors. He really wanted to um, basically electrify the whole, if he, as he was buying the brand, his vision was to electrify the every Hummer vehicle from the H2 down to the future H4 and H5 and basically convert Hummer from the environmental antichrist into a model of environmental efficiency. Hmm. As it happened, uh, for a variety of reasons, General Motors decided not to sell the brand and to wind it down. Um, but the idea lives on in uh, the Via pickups, which then the VIA program, of course, can easily be extended into the full-size vans, which then, if you imagine catering weddings, uh, the vans that bring the stuff, you know, the tables and chairs and everything, uh, can then power the whole outdoor wedding. I mean, the tent, the heat lamps, the band. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it really is, uh, and I think for construction workers or carpenters, plumbers, um, anybody who has to do anything outdoors with a pickup truck, there's no longer any need to drag along one of those uh, generators on a trailer or have a huge, huge generator in the pickup truck bed. Now the pickup truck itself is that generator. That's both a, that's both a, maybe not a cost savings, but it's a security issue too because those generators are so very easily stolen off of job well, sites. Not only that, it is a cost saving because for the public utilities who buy these things, the combination of monthly depreciation on the truck or monthly payment on the truck plus fuel cost is lower for the via truck than for a conventional gasoline truck. So it, it for the... Uh, for utility fleets around the country, it makes sense from day one. And then think of military applications. If you have a military base, either a fixed base in the United States or a forward base in a combat zone, uh, a vulnerable portion of the base is obviously your power generation, whether that's a conventional power plant or a bunch of diesel generators. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have 50 or 100 of these pickup trucks deployed around the base, the elimination of the power station is not a problem as long as there's some gasoline in each one of those pickup trucks. Oops. Everybody still there? Yeah, I'm there. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. We had a, something, a, noise, <laughs> something, a noise cut out. I'm like, what happened? I have to make sure you know what the noise cutting out was probably my heater. And, yes, I'm in California and I have the heater on, so kill me now. Oh. <laughs> but the heater's right under my desk, and I realized it was probably making noise on my microphone. Um, so I muted myself. But we have a question from the chat room. Um, is the military interested in the application for defense for on the EV? Well, I think electric vehicles or vehicles that can operate electrically are, um, attract a great deal of interest from the military because the military a lot of times has to conduct stealth operations. And an electric vehicle is both silent, and you could argue, well, you could probably work on a conventional vehicle enough to make it silent, too. But the problem is a conventional vehicle always has a heat source called the engine and the glowing manifolds and everything, and that can be picked up by any sort of infrared detection device. So uh, conventional vehicles are always going to be visible, uh, whereas electric vehicles run 
cool enough. I mean, there's a little bit of heat generated in the batteries, but not enough to show up. So an electric vehicle is both silent and creates no heat signature. So for stealthy nighttime military operations, they are without equal. We've had another question from the chat room, and uh, I'm sure you probably get this question a number of times, actually. Uh, can you please ask Bob Letts if he thinks there's any chance that GM will bring back the Pontiac brand? <laughs> well, I'd like to see it. And of course, I'm no longer in charge of that, but yeah. I, I really don't think so. I think the and, – and Pontiac was the one brand that I hated the most to see depart. Um, Saab going, I could live with that. That was a – an interesting brand, but it was a perennial source of losses. Um, Hummer, as we said, had become uh, a liability from a from a corporate image standpoint. And uh, Saturn was a perennial money loser, and also, unfortunately, in terms of appeal to the public, largely overlapped with Chevrolet. And that's one of the reasons why mm. Chevrolet is doing so much better now. Mm. is that it no longer has to compete for the same customers with Saturn. So all have of they, those were fine. Have they seen a number of the of the Saturn buyers transfer over to Chevrolet? Um I I'm not, you know, mm. I'm not privy to the statistics <laughs> material anymore, but I would say judgmentally, you know, it's mm. happening. It's one of the fears I know that of canceling Saturn brand was was losing what they call the orphan customers and uh, going to other brands after they'd uh, lost their, their preferred brand from General Motors. Yeah, I, I know that Pontiac, uh, the picking up Pontiac customers by Buick and Chevrolet has been very successful so far. Hmm. Uh, but Pontiac, I think, was in the process of being rehabilitated and being returned to its roots with the G8, and, um, and that it was going to be followed by a smaller lighter rear-wheel drive sedan, sort of mm. more along the size of a BMW 3 Series. And, of course, you had the Solstice and the Solstice GXT. So we were in the process of really making Pontiac a different brand, moving away from front-wheel drive and going to rear-wheel drive sporty cars across the board, which I think would have been a nice complement to the, to the GM portfolio. And Pontiac, instead of basically offering the same technology as the Chevrolet Buick uh, was now going to be was now going to stand apart. Unfortunately, Chapter 11 intervened and the federal government is one of the conditions for uh, bailing out the company uh, sadly insisted that Pontiac be one of the brands to be eliminated. So it's gone. I regret it. I, yeah. I think it was a pity to see it go. Especially hearing now when you're talking about some of the future product that, that we might have seen from, from Pontiac. Uh, you say small rear-drive 3 Series, kind of yeah. like Cadillac ATS-style stuff? It would have been off the same architecture as oh. Cadillac ATS, but sort of depremiumized to make it more affordable. Oh, that makes me sick to hear. <laughs> yeah, it would have been unique in the U.S. I mean, not, yeah. Nobody offers a car like that. No, no, indeed not. I mean, you'd have to go to Europe for that kind of thing. I mean, that's yeah. that's yeah. Oh, I think uh, we're going to go to the actual queue of uh, of questions that we have now as well, Michelle. Yeah, we seem to have a lot of people. Um, I, I think don't doubt it. <laughs> queuing up to ask questions. Ben, can you make the first question asker come live, please? Hello, it's Jim Campbell calling from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, I actually had the, the distinct uh, honor to meet Jim Campbell from uh, VP of Chevrolet Motorsports the other day at SEMA, so I've kind of made my my uh, my dream come true being able to, to ask the, the great Bob Lutz a, a couple of quick questions, if I don't mind. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Bob, I, I guess I've been I've been following you and 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 listening to you and and quite a bit on on uh, with regards to actually on online TV. Now. I guess what's happened to cellulose ethanol? You, you were I was under the impression you kind of were were, were behind a program there and yeah, yeah, it, it seems a, to be kind of gone. GM effort. Yeah, I think uh, the whole ethanol thing has sort of run out of steam to be honest and uh, I've been gone for a year and a half. I don't know what the reason is, but uh, there was a lot of opposition uh, from the oil companies on putting on, putting in E85 pumps. Mm because um, uh, pumps are very precious real estate at every gas station. And the oil companies quite naturally 
want to see maximum productivity come out of those pumps. So each pump is kind of judged on how many gallons does it pump per day. Uh, the E85 pumps would have been there, and they probably, at least for the first few years, would not have pumped a lot of fuel. So mm. the oil company said, hey, we, can't af- we really cannot afford to put in a pump that's not going to pump a lot of gallons. And I, I think really uh, ethanol <coughs> faced a pretty big hostility from the oil companies as a unique fuel. Now, what the oil companies want to do is to say, we'll take your ethanol and we'll blend it into gasoline generally and we'll go to so-called E20, where all pump fuel will have 20% alcohol. And, of course, there you've got the small engine industry in the United States, the marine industry, and the automotive industry saying, wait, hold the phone. An engine that has not been specifically designed to be ethanol tolerated is going to be destroyed by E20. Mm. So I don't think that went anywhere either. Uh, to, to tell you the truth, I, d- I don't have the detail mm. on what happened or where it is right now, but I, I, at this point I would say uh, ethanol faces a dim future, whether it's uh, from corn or ethanol or, or uh, cellulose. One more quick thing, if I could ask you real quick, is um, and, and following you, and of course with the, the your with the concept of the Dodge Viper, and I know you've done work in Corvette and and CTSV and 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 the coupe and all that kind of stuff with with regards to the performance part of the engines for General Motors, and uh, and of course the Viper, and I guess what it is, there's there's a lot of hoopla around this this new Ford uh, V6 with the twin turbos, and 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 the fact that General Motors did this in the Buick Grand National back in. I get whatever it was, the early 80s, and, and had the, the fact that, you know, forced induction was really the replacement for displacement. Why are we so, why is General Motors so much on this displacement on demand, which I'm, I'm hearing is just nothing but a real nightmare as far as how these engines are working? No, I think, uh, I think displacement on demand, is that what you're asking? Yeah, like, yeah. Why, why aren't we, do, we working on it, the smaller engine with, with turbocharging yeah, and supercharging? We, we call it active fuel management, but uh, GM is pursuing a lot of different courses. Uh, you've got uh, the active fuel management with cylinder cutoff in the full-size pickup trucks and sport utilities. I have a Tahoe with it, and a lot of times I select that display on the instrument panel to see how often I am in four-cylinder. And, you know, you on a flat freeway of, uh, at 65 or 70 miles an hour, you kick in the cruise control, it'll run on four cylinders and uh, will deliver in the high 20s in highway fuel economy, sometimes even the low 30s, so that works. And uh, But at the other end of the spectrum, in what Ford calls Echo Boost, which are small engines with turbocharging, GM does that too. The, the 1.4 liter uh, Chevy Cruze that gets uh, 40 miles per gallon plus on the highway, that's a very small engine for a car that size with turbocharging, and it, it, it delivers, so the principal the principle works fine if you have a, a, an engine that's basically too small for the vehicle, and during the times of maximum power or torque demand, you rely on turbocharging and with a turbo basically tuned for torque rather than for high-end horsepower. Uh, you can fool the car into cruising on the highway with the benefit of a very small engine operating at peak efficiency, and in times of added power need, it'll behave like a large engine. So it does work. It works It works for Ford. It works for GM. And I think it's one of the avenues that's going to be used as we um, fight for improved fuel economy to make the, the future um, fuel economy mandates. Great. Well, thank you very much for your question. I think we have a, another Canadian on the line wants to uh, to ask a question, Ben. We have another caller. Must be the same Canadian. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. Hi, Bob. Well, someone asked an interesting question in the chat room. Um, they want to hear about what vehicles almost came to be, but that you nixed them. Oh, um, well, one of them was a a hopelessly ugly uh, seven passenger Saturn View. Oh my! Which looked like it looked like one of those uh, early Dodge church vans, you know, that had about 
three foot of overhang added to the back to make an 18 <laughs> out of it. Oh my and god! And this was a Saturn that that just never stopped. Oh. Saturn U. And I said, who is who on earth would want to do this? <laughs> and uh, it was well, you know, um, management was very upset when Dodge did the Durango because the Durango had three rows of seats, so management, the, the edict came from management that from now on, every sport utility we do has to have a seven-passenger version. Oh, my God. And I said, well, that's ridiculous, and we're definitely not going to do this one because it's completely sales-proof. And uh, that one got... <laughs> And then there was, uh, do you remember the original Buick LaCrosse concept car? That oh, yeah. Was in, it was very beautiful, sleek, low, with a very low belt line and a huge toothy grin. And um, it was decided that that had been a very successful show car, so we will adopt the styling cues and put them on a midsize sedan. Well, obviously it didn't translate because... Ooh. The appeal of the show car was the fact that it was very low swung, very sleek, very low roof height, and by the time you transpose that on a on a normal passenger car architecture, it just looked ridiculous. And there was this Oof. huge like chrome watermelon hanging out of the front of the car, and uh, I said, "Good grief, what what is this?" And they said, "Well, you know the." Um, the edict from management is we shouldn't do show cars just for show cars' sake. If we do a show car that's successful, we should try to put it into production. So that didn't work, and I was able to get rid of that one. And then a fairly nice roadster, if you recall, the Buick Bengal, which uh, was a two-passenger mm -hmm. Buick mm -hmm. sport car. That was beautiful. It was quite nice. It, I don't think it was brilliant in terms of design innovation but you know it was it was decent so they had wanted to see if they could put that into production and did a lot of studies and it was so much in, and then once again the proportions of the car had to be changed in order to make it realistic for production and uh, it was so much money and so little car at the end I said that one doesn't make any sense so mm. We axed that one, and then of course there's the one that I should have axed and didn't, which was the GMC Envoy XUV, mm. the one that had sort of like a roll top desk on top. <laughs> um, and it, it, for people who want to transport grandfather clocks standing upright. And very tall plants, yes. Yeah, or yeah, or, or large <laughs> trees. So actually, that we actually, one they talked me into. You know, they just buried me in analysis, and uh, and finally I I said, well, okay, you you folks have obviously done your homework here. Uh, in my judgment, it won't sell, but I I have to trust. You know, you can't come into a company and call everybody an idiot and impose your will all the time because you would very quickly shut people down. So. To even in some cases, even though your gut is telling you this isn't going to work, you do have to listen to the people and trust them and show some mm. respect for their intelligence and for their work, which in this particular case I did. And uh, two and a half years and $275 million later, wow. the vehicle came out and <laughs> oh, uh, instead of selling ninety to to 100000 a year, we sold 13000 in the first year and shut it down. Well, now it's a collector's item, right? Yeah. Well, I would hope. Well, I mean, sometimes uh, you know, AMC Pacers are collectors' items. Exactly. And uh, I, I think one might want to corner the market on Aztecs because they could be hugely valuable someday too. They are some of the most polarizing vehicle owners, I should say, Absolutely. that I've, I've ever met. The owners love them. They love them. They're fanatical about them. Yeah. We actually have Mark. Are you still on the line here? Uh, yes, I am. You are. Please go ahead and ask your questions, sir. Oh, hi, Bob. Uh, pleasure to talk to you. I've been uh, an admirer of, of you for many years and uh, have a great respect for you. Well, thank you. Uh, enjoyed the book. Uh, my only complaint great. was that it was maybe a little too short. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, you can blame the publisher for that because <laughs> it was longer and it got edited down. Oh, no. 
Um, I, I think I think from reading your book, that what you brought to GM was really a lot of uh, really plain common sense that seemed to be totally absent from the executive level. Yeah. Um, you had all these executives there, you know, with years of experience and MBAs who seemed to care more about uh, deadlines and the bottom line rather than the product. Yeah. Well, that's, um, that, that's why I call it the battle for the soul of American business, because that that kind of thinking was engendered by the, the nation's business schools, and it's not uh, it's not unique to the automobile industry, unfortunately. Well, that actually leads to my my, my question perfectly. Uh, so what what is it that the business schools have been teaching uh, for decades that results in executives being what, more focused on – sorry? Yeah, what the business schools – what the focus of the business schools is – is basically short-term profit maximization and using all kinds of clever techniques to reduce cost. And uh, basically what the business schools do is they do not focus on customer satisfaction. They don't focus on customer loyalty. They don't focus on uh, adding cost that creates customer value or customer delight. For instance, if you look at Apple products, if you've bought an iPad or an iPod or an iPhone, look at the packaging, the beautiful wrapping, the box within a box, and the way everything nestles in there, the pleasurable customer experience begins with unwrapping the product. And people are are sensitive to that. It, it, by the time they've got the iPod or the uh, iPhone out of the box, they feel that they've like unwrapped a, unwrapped a precious piece of jewelry. Now, a bean counter would look at that and say, we don't have to use all that packaging. Just put it in a corrugated packet. You know, put a little bubble wrap around it, put it in a small corrugated cardboard container, put some tape on it, and ship it. It'll be just as safe and just as effective, and we're probably probably wasting two bucks, two bucks a unit on this type of packaging. And it's this type of um, psychologically attuned ability to relate to the customer and customer delight, which the business schools absolutely don't teach. All I, they I, teach is techniques for financial analysis, of ways to get at cost, ways to get at budgets, et cetera, et cetera, uh, optimization techniques, you know, how many plants do you really need, where should they be, how do we minimize transportation costs, it's all what I call they're basically teaching a cost minimization model as opposed to a revenue generation model. And Steve Jobs, of course, <clears throat> hadn't gone to business school. He was a product fanatic. So he spent on stuff like beautiful packaging, beautiful design, and look where it took him. You know, we actually had a question um, by email that came in, and I'll – Bear with me while I read this. Um, it fits this, I think. There's an effort inside General Motors being led by Dan Ackerson and others in finance to, quote, deluxify General Motors by decontenting cars and not using the highest grade materials. Given that GM is not yet back and a large proportion of Americans still view GM as government motors, how short-sighted do you feel this is? Right now, there are many new GM cars that feel like genuine values given the sticker price and the level of content. But surely this will not last in the pursuit to squeeze the last one tenth of every one percent of profit. <laughs> well, that that question that that question is more acted, it's more of a statement than a question. I, guess I, question, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not really. And, and, and by the way, it's 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 totally wrong, and I I don't agree with any of it. And uh, I will tell you that Dan Ackerson may not be um, a thirty-year veteran of the automobile industry, but I consider that a good thing because mm. he doesn't have thirty years of pro in the wrong direction. Mm. And uh, Dan Ackerson looks at it very simplistically. <clears throat> he says, back in the days when we made <clears throat> cars that were just barely good enough, we didn't make any money. Now that we're making cars that are better than they need to be, the customer recognizes the value, we're realizing much higher a average transaction prices, and the company is profitable. Why would we change a successful formula? So uh, there is as I spent the whole day at GM today as part of my consulting contract, and I can tell you everybody is focused on excellence. Everybody is focused on detail execution. Uh, there are some areas where the company doesn't feel 
it's as good yet as it as it should be. And one of those is the weight of the vehicles, where where GM is going to have to concentrate on making the vehicles lighter. Uh, but there is no drive whatsoever to remove uh, value from the cars to to uh, increase margins. None. That's that's the that's the old days. That doesn't exist anymore. That's a pretty big institutional change for General Motors. Well, that's what you get when the institutional change came about when, um, by I think force of will and tolerance on the part of Rick Wagner, I was allowed to change from cost-optimized cars that you could just barely get by with to cars that were arguably better than they needed to be, like the Chevrolet Cruze, and all of the cars that have extra cost in them, uh, way more cost than, than what we used to put in, but the average transaction prices are so much higher that these vehicles are profitable. So I think it was a, a demonstration, um, and it would have been very it's very tough to get a company to make that bet because they say, well, what if it doesn't work? Well, you know, you can't guarantee that it's going to work. In this case, the company toughed it out long enough. Now it's working. And I think everybody says, now that we're doing world-class, world-class vehicles, we're profitable and increasing market share again. So why should we go back? That's interesting. We have another caller. We have um, Jeff coming in, I believe. Ben? Ben? Jeff? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, anybody home? We're here. <laughs> We're sure here. Well, well it, maybe hey, we Bob, don't this, Oh, there we go. Go ahead. Hello, Bob. Hi, this is Len Fedor from the GSA in Washington, D.C. Oh, there we go. Just kind of curious to see where do you see the next leap in battery technology uh, taking uh, passenger cars and trucks? Uh, that's hard to say. There's uh, there's a number of different lithium compounds being worked on, like lithium sulfur and so forth, that look very promising from an energy storage, storage standpoint, but uh, do have some potential thermal problems or stability problems. So it's probably going to take you know, four or five years to bring that on stream, but I think it's safe to say that within the next 10 years, the energy storage capacity of batteries will triple and the cost will come down. So once you've got a 3x factor in storage capacity and at the same time a 3x factor in, in uh, cost coming down, uh, I think the purely electric vehicle will become viable because you really do need about a 300. You need a combination of a 300-mile range, a relatively short recharge time, and um, a, a cost that is not very much higher than a conventional automobile. And everybody's working on that, and I'm you know, convinced they'll get there. You, you spoke about... Uh thermal issues with batteries and I, we do have to ask a number of people have asked the question sure. how do you how the load, do you, it's the loaded issue the loaded issue how do you yeah. think how, what's your opinion of how GM is handling the current questions about uh, the volt battery and fire safety well, not fire in, safety but in my judgment uh, the company has almost gone a little bit too far in saying, yes, yes, there's something we should look at here. Yes, yes, we'll make changes. Yes, yes, we'll provide loaners to people who are worried. Um, that's all good, and that's, a, a, I suppose, a lesson out of what not to do uh, when Toyota kind of stonewalled on, on their mm -hmm. problems and mm -hmm. Ford appeared to stonewall on the fire Firestone tire issue and so forth. But there is a point where I think you have to get out there and say, look, this is a test that is in no way reflective of real life. The test took place in May of 2011. In the summer of 2011, NHTSA gave the Volt a five-star safety rating and declared it to be one of the safest cars in America. And during this test, we're the car, get this, the vehicle is totaled. It's no longer drivable. And um, hopefully 
believe the owners, the occupants, would have been uninjured or not severely injured. The protocol calls for discharging the battery after a severe accident. That was not done. The vehicle was then placed in an impound lot where after three weeks it caught fire. Now, I ask you, where is there even the faintest risk to human life if uh, a thermal event occurs three weeks after the, the vehicle is totaled? You really would think that any halfway sentient people would find the three weeks long enough to get out of the car. And that's that's how the industry is is largely the EV industry is largely reacting. I mean, we've all known for years that it's only a matter of time till someone's in a fatal wreck or there's a car that catches on fire or something happens with gas cars every day. This is a dream scenario for us. Absolutely, it's why they spent so many. I mean, Look, well, you you know, they spent so much money in California training people with the EV1. I mean, the first responders, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are 250,000 gasoline-powered vehicles that catch fire in the United States every year. It's sort of like one every 130 seconds. Wow. Some gasoline-powered cars somewhere, either due to an accident or a fuel a fuel line leak on onto the exhaust manifold or something catches fire. The the reason this is getting a lot of attention is because uh, the Volt itself gets a lot of attention. But at any rate, um, I, I think, I mean, I continue to drive a Volt. I'd, I'd put my wife in a Volt. I'd put my kids in a Volt. I think the Volt is, from all standpoints, thermal safety, accident safety, et cetera, one of the absolute safest cars in the world today. Hard to, hard to disagree with that, quite frankly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, when uh, when this really started to hit the fan, um, a couple of uh, friends, like Ben Wadilla from Popular Mechanics, and I got together and we came up with a bunch of questions as we were listening to the uh, to the actual conference call with uh, Mark yeah. Royce and everybody on there. We sent a bunch of questions to Rob Peterson, the uh, the Volt Minister of Propaganda, as we yeah. like to call him. Things like, you know, if if I was in a collision in a Volt, would I be more likely to die from electrocution or from the fireball? Things like that. <laughs> And he did. He didn't respond to us immediately. <laughs> well, I tell you, there was. Um, I can say this not being part of GM, yeah. but I think GM tried to go the extra mile, and probably with good justification. But that doesn't mean I have to like it. I think they went the extra mile to avoid casting disparagement on the Nitsa test. Yes. And yes. Um, and because for an automobile company, a good relationship with NHTSA is a very important thing. You don't want to get on the bad side of them. But as I told Dan Ackerson today, I think I think on balance the company went a little bit too far mm. in making sure NHTSA was happy with what we said mm. as opposed to making sure that the public understood that there was no real-world risk here. That, that's my bottom line on it. Indeed. Well, we'll see. We'll see more of this in the future. Unfortunately, the issue is not going away anytime soon now that uh, Dara Alyssa has called uh, some hearings on the issue to see exactly how much NHTSA knew and when in terms well, of the... This is all stupid. I mean, yes. <laughs> frankly, this is just box stupid because to imply that there is a public safety issue here when there is a slowly generating self-generating fire after three weeks, three weeks after the car is totaled, how can anyone imply any risk to the motoring public? I mean, this is, this is, this is beginning to border on insanity. It does, indeed. I was getting questions from reporters asking me to try and, and compare the Volt situation to the Pinto, and after the second one did that, I have to give them an earful. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm a respected science writer, too. And I'm like, are you seriously asking that question? Oh. Well, that's because they're looking for, they're, they're, you know, they're trying to sell papers. Exactly. And they're looking for the sensationalist headline. And, uh, and, and frankly, they think they've got a hold of a live one now, and everybody wants to top everyone else. And this is one of the reasons why um, I spoke or wrote somewhat unkindly about the American print media 
in car guys versus bean counters because this is fairly typical behavior and I don't think it serves the country well or it, or it doesn't serve the country's industry well. Mm, indeed. Have we got more callers? I'm sure we have more callers on the line. I believe that we do, Ben. Who do we have in the queue next? Hi, Bob. This is Jeff in Santa Monica, and I'm the guy that you uh, built the vault for. Yeah, great. I think <laughs> you like it. I, 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 drive, I drive less than 40 miles a day usually, sometimes a little more. And I have almost 12,000 miles all battery electric on my Volt. Wow. Great. You know, so I was wondering uh, uh, if you look at your screen, you're probably fighting with uh, Jay Leno, who is very proud of the fact that his screen comes up with an average of over 1,000 miles per gallon. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. What, I mean, I've, I've only bought 22 gallons of gas this year. Okay. What's your screen say as, in terms of average mileage? It says... Oh, for the life of the car, it's 250 plus because the meter tops out at 250 plus. But when I get my report, when I get my report, my monthly report from OnStar, of course, it says 485 miles per gallon. My uh, God, well, you, you got to work to catch Jay. He's <laughs> Wait, well, I, actually, is Jay Leno? Jay, does, does Jay Leno have like his assistant driving that car? Because Jay drives all of his cars all of the time. <laughs> No, no, I know Jay. I met him at the Volt Owners Party GM through just before the auto show. Ah. And Jay and I actually have the exact same model Volt. Uh-huh. And, and yes, he drives his car. Yeah, he well, he loves it. A lot. And, and every, my, my son-in-law traded in uh, a 911 Porsche Turbo for his Volt. And, wow. Well, he lives in Palos Verdes. And, uh, you know, in Southern California, if you show up with a Porsche Turbo, nobody... And, and, and nobody notices. That's true. But you show yeah. up with a vault, everybody notices. Vault. Mm. So that gets uh, to me to my question, which is: I read your book and I loved it. Every American should read it. Um, you said in *Revenge of the Electric Car* that the electrification of the automobile is a foregone conclusion. Yeah. And I was wondering how you feel the marketing of the Volt's going and the advertising. Do you think? Chevy's doing the right job and that the the public is getting educated properly and will well, accept the Volt. Do you, do you think I, we'll see a double dip in the like the EV1 experience? I I think uh Chevrolet is doing all they can given uh given how much budget that they can allocate to it um to educate people on the advantages of the Volt. But, you know, it's going to be a slow process. And by electrification, I don't necessarily mean that everything is going to, in the next 10 years, I don't mean that everything is going to have the same degree of electrification as the Volt. Some of it will be much milder. Some of it will be um, a, a hybrid drive, sort of more like more like the Toyota Prius. Uh, some of it may be very light electrification, like we've got in the Buick LaCrosse now with what GM called e-assist, which gives you about, you know, a 10 or 12 or 15 percent boost in mileage. But the 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 thing is, uh, five or six years from now, as we approach these ever more stringent fuel economy standards, I think just about every vehicle is going to have to have some sort of electric assist in order to, of greater or lesser, in order to meet the mileage requirements. So, so back to the Porsche direction. I want to know when we can get a Volt with that kind of performance. I want the torque of the EV1 in the Volt. Well, you know, power and range are always a trade-off, and uh, I don't. If you uh, if you move the lever into the if you move the gear lever into the aft position on the Volt, of course you're in sport mode and it 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 does feel like it's going quite a bit faster. I think performance of the Volt is is adequate. I don't I don't see making a sports car out of it, frankly. Well, here's here's an interesting question though. I think how will we see? And maybe too soon to talk about it, but the Cadillac ELR. Yeah. What kind of a different experience should we expect? Do you think between the ELR and the Volt? I don't know because I am not privy to those details. Oh, but, too bad. Uh, <laughs> I considered it a major victory that I was able to get the company to do it. Agreed. 
That was one of the. I think that's one of the most attractive concept cars that GM has had in, well, in recent was, years. Every show it went to, it made best concept, and many people said, "Hey, I need that car. I don't care what's driving it." Yeah, it looks like a little mini Lamborghini Gallardo, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. I, I do have to ask a question uh, on my own here about um, your involvement with Lotus. Yeah. I understand you're, you're you're an advisor to to yeah, Lotus. Yeah, I'm a member of the so-called advisory board, so I consult <laughs> for them. And uh, in fact, I'm going over this weekend to spend um, a weekend in Hessel and mm. uh, being brought up to date. And they, it's, just, it's just they've got a a group of people who are known as automotive enthusiasts and who are experienced in the car business that sort of form a second board, which is not. Not the legal board. The legal board is, as usual, you know, mostly bankers and mm -hmm. Malaysian government officials, since it's mm -hmm. a Malaysian-owned company. Uh, but uh, Danny Bahar, the CEO, I think very wisely decided uh, that board is going to look at financial performance and, you know, treasury stuff, but is not going to give him any advice and guidance in the automobile business. So he assembled a second board called the advisory board which has, is really a bunch of interesting a bunch of interesting car guys of all nationalities and uh, we frequently disagree which is normal when you get a bunch of car guys in the same room but we are able to i think drive lotus in the in the right direction and get lotus do the same transformation at lotus that occurred with Aston Martin which is to take it from a company with so little volume, like 2,000 a year, where it almost doesn't matter, and get that company up to about 10 or 12,000 vehicles a year, which would make it meaningful and and profitable. Well, they came out with a range of vehicles, like six or like five or six concepts that yeah. that they were coming out with. Can they actually make that many yeah, vehicles? Well, one of them, one of them, uh, the Elan and the Esprit kind of overlapped so yeah. the Elan is going to be pushed back some but uh, the Esprit is on course the Elise is on course uh, hmm. the big rear wheel drive coupe is on course and, the, hmm. and uh, the interesting thing is these, these vehicles are engineered in such a way uh, it's a similar philosophy to BMW where you can do different cars of different sizes but you're basically always using the same Lego set. You're just putting the bricks together in different ways. Hmm. So, were these all? Were they all designed by by Roger Becker? Hmm? Were they designed by Roger Becker, or are these just ongoing, changing designs? No, the the, the, the chief designer at Lotus today is Donato Coco, who is the former chief designer of Ferrari. Ah. Yeah, he's there's... very good. He did he did all of those concept cars that you saw. They were attractive. I saw them in. Uh... My favorite, of course, is the four door sedan. And Donato Coco didn't want to put it in the show because he said it's it's not finished. It's not finished. I need to massage the shape some more. The, mm -hmm. the sculpting of the of the the body isn't finished. And I said, hey Donato, look, it'd be a shame to miss the show season with the four-door sedan because that's the big surprise and that's the one that could ultimately be very successful that was the etern correct yeah yes i saw i saw them in uh, la i think it was a year ago when uh yeah. last year i call when, that the aston martin killer when when sharon <laughs> well, stone they, uh, revealed they will them. be they will be priced lower than Aston Martins or Ferraris or Lamborghinis. So I'm hoping that, um, like the Bentleys, the small Bentleys, the Audi A8-based Bentleys, that these Lotus vehicles will, obviously they're the, the larger ones, the V8s and so forth, will uh, be over $100,000. But uh, if you're sort of in the mid-100s, I think you're you're hitting the sweet spot. You get over 200 and towards the 250 and 275, you know, the, the air gets pretty thin there. But um, I, I think I think Lotus has a good business plan. They're well managed. They uh, they've got financial discipline. They know what they're doing, and it's a an international team. The chief engineer is uh, Wolfgang Zimmermann, formerly of AMG, 
So he definitely knows what he's doing. It's a, it's a good team. I feel very good about it. That's good to hear. Again, there was a lot of curiosity about about the company, given the fact that they had so many vehicle concepts that they came out with, and even just one or two of those would be a yeah, difficult you know, and, thing and to do. Some of them, some of them are not final. Some yeah. of them will will change, or or they'll be slightly modified for production reasons. But mm-hmm. I think it was a it was very clever because what the company needed most of all was to get itself visible again and show that it's alive and well and under new management. And you could spend a ton of money, uh, like you could spend 10 or 15 or $20 million and not achieve that. But you do a couple of maybe a million dollars worth of concept cars that are very close to what you're actually going to build, and the whole world takes notice. And even if some of the car, some of the comments were negative, and said, well, this is this is way too much, and they'll never do it, and et cetera, et cetera. But, it, it, you know, the old saying, uh, I don't care what you write about me, but please spell my name right. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think our, our next question actually comes from – I'm almost embarrassed to say this. I don't think I've ever met anybody that I can't say is a Bob Lutz fanboy, but, <laughs> but is another fanboy, um, Alex who um, is one of the um, directors of GM Inside News, one of our co-streaming partners, and he's got a question. Oh, hello. Hey, Bob. This is Alex from GM Inside News. I think we've met a couple times on the auto show circuit. Uh, I hate to swing it back to GM, but uh, as we run run the site, uh, people want to know, what do you think that GM has to do as far as trying to get Opal back into black? I mean, obviously they have some really good product. Um, either it, right now coming out and some stuff coming down in the future. Uh, is, do you think it's more of a labor price negotiations, or is there a, something else that's causing uh, Opal to, to stay in the red? What, Opal? Uh, yeah, with Opal, yeah. About Opal? Well, look, I, I, I don't think there's a single manufacturer in Europe right now who is making money in the European market. I mean, it's tough. There's... Uh, there's a lot of overcapacity, um, a lot of people in the middle, and the companies that are making money, like Volkswagen, uh, Audi, um, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, they are not dependent on the German market or, or on the European market because uh, they export all over the world. They produce all over the world. In the case of Volkswagen and Audi, they have the same tailwind that GM does, which is a huge presence in China, which is incredibly lucrative. Uh, Mercedes and BMW, in in addition to that, also have production facilities in the United States where they're producing in dollars and shipping back to Europe. But you look at the companies that are kind of landlocked in Europe, Fiat. Uh, Right now, Fiat, if, if they hadn't bought Chrysler, and we're not getting a ton of financial assistance from a newly profitable Chrysler Corporation, Fiat would be in dire straits. And I know that Renault is hurting. Uh, Ford of Europe is losing money. Um, uh, Peugeot Citroën is hurting. So the European environment is is a desperate situation for everybody. And was there, I, my guess is there is going to have to be further consolidation in that market or everybody's going to be unprofitable. Question from the chat room. Um, what do you think about the uh, BMW plug-in car plans? The BMW what car plans? The plug-in car plans. It would have to be the BMW oh, i brand, well, yeah. They, 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 uh, I think it'll be a lot. I, I personally don't like it aesthetically if it's uh, – that i3 concept that they showed at the show, so, uh, I mean, that, to me, my personal taste is I think that's very hard to love. But technologically, it'll be very similar to a Volt because uh, they've got uh, uh, Frank Weber, who was the, the vehicle line executive for the Chevrolet Volt, was hired away from BMW, and I'm sure uh, the second time around he'll do just as good a job as he did the first time around. <laughs> Absolutely. Do we have any other uh, I questions believe we have callers? like several questions. Ben, who's next? Try and get as many on as we can, I guess, before the <laughs> 10 o'clock rounds are up. I know. We've got very little time. 
I'm glad to hear that Mr. Lutz agrees with Mr. Ackerson coming along there. I just want to let Bob Lutz know that I have one of the few CTS Cadillacs in the state of Maine, and I'm a retiree from GM after 41 years, but it's a great car, and I was glad to see Rick Wagner hired him in. I'm glad to hear he's still working with General Motors. Thank you. Okay, well, great. Thanks for your thanks for your service. Thanks for the call. Tell everybody about the car. <laughs> Well, who's next, Ben? Hi, this is Keith uh, in the Detroit area. Mm-hmm. Hi, Keith. Um, and my question is, you know, and, and this is really just a snapshot from today, but if to follow up on, on what was said earlier about Europe, if you look at what's going on, GM is not profitable in Europe. They're not profitable in South America. They're sort of in tough straits in, in China with the, with the market declining there. No, no, and no, in the U.S. Uh, wait, wait, I've got to stop you. China is highly profitable, and the market is not dropping off. It's simply growing a little less fast. Okay, sorry. Sorry about yeah. that. But I, I, I guess my, my question was that it seems that at least in the U.S., we're back to a dependence on perhaps smaller, but at least uh, trucks and SUVs. And um, it's well, you know, that's, you know that's, are, are we back to the same problem that we yeah, had before? I, 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 and um, obviously, trucks, SUVs, full-size crossovers, uh, full-size cars are always going to be more profitable than small cars because um, whether you like it or not, the public equates price with vehicle size. Maybe not as much as they used to, but they still do. And you can charge more money for a larger, more powerful one than you can for a small one. And yet, if you look at the total cost of an, of an automobile, uh, the initial investment required, the amount of engineering that, that you've got to amortize over the life of the car, uh, the, the number of labor hours in the car, there really is not that much cost difference between a small one, a medium-sized one, and a large one. But you can charge more for the big ones. So I think it's 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 just a fact of life that in the market um, the big cars are going to do better. And full size SUVs happen to be, uh, if as long as fuel remains affordable, those are vehicles that the American public loves, and they're making a big comeback. So the challenge is going to be how do you make these full size vehicles? far more fuel efficient, even if it results in additional cost, so that they'll meet the fuel economy mandates and are still available to the public. And uh, uh, frankly, uh, with that's one of the things that Via Motors is all, is all about, is the, the uh, electrification of full-size trucks. Okay, so we're going to take um, Rick next, and this is going to be our next to the last question because I know we need to let Mr. Let's go because it is getting late in the evening. Yep, and I have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. To yes, I got a question for Bob uh, on the Opal thing. Uh, is there any chance, like the 3 Series you were talking about, could be made into an Opal model, um, sold in Europe as an Opal, opposed to Cadillac? I know GM wants to push Cadillac, but... Uh, there's a time factor involved. I mean, five or ten years probably to establish Cadillac really to where they want it to be in Europe. So an alternative would be uh, something like a three series or even one series as an Opal. Uh, just building it in Europe because you're going to have to pay a hefty fee anyway, and it helps you know, to uh, be. You a, know, we we tried that with the uh, we tried that with the sort of. Cadillac, small Cadillac that looked a lot like a CTS, but it was based on a Saab architecture. And we did a very good job on differentiation, both exterior and interior, but it didn't work. And uh, I think for Cadillacs to be successful in Europe, uh, is they're going to have to be genuine Cadillacs, and they probably need to be exported from the United States. And right now, Given where the dollar is, and given with the with the uh, cooperation that we're getting from the UAW, uh, strange to say, the U.S. is a very good place to build vehicles right now, even for export. But I think the future of Cadillac is going to be the, the near-term future of Cadillacs in the next 10 years. 
is really going to be in North America and in China, where Cadillac is on a very, very steep growth curve. And uh, China is now the world's largest market for luxury vehicles. So I think the, the feeling is that GM, we make, we make Cadillac into a global brand by further building it in the United States and then um, expanding it as quickly as we possibly can in China. And uh, those two those two markets will will guarantee the success of the Cadillac brand globally. Excellent. And if if Europe comes, you know, five years later, six years later, or eight years later, it's kind of like who cares? We have one last question from the general public, and that will be from Frank. Are you there, Frank? Hi, Mr. Lutz. Uh, Frank Shirosky. Uh, disclosure, I write for TorqueNews.com, but I'm also a former early retired GM uh, design engineer. Uh, short question, pertaining to advanced engine technology for in, uh, uh, combustion engines, yeah. HCCI versus split cycle uh, technology relative to the GM mandate, uh, or I'm sorry, the government mandate of uh, 2025 of 54.5 miles per gallon. Yeah, um, all I know is that HCCI um, is looks very promising. Um, if it can, if if HCCI can attain and maintain stable combustion all the way from idle to say up to 5,000 RPM, it will permit gasoline engines to basically run sparkless and uh, achieve the same fuel economy benefit as a diesel engine namely roughly a 20% improvement. So I think advanced combustion technology is definitely part of the equation that's uh, that's going to be incorporated into cars along with electrification. Of course, the more you can attain with the conventional internal combustion engine, the less you have to put into expensive batteries uh, because further improvements with internal combustion is a very is a relatively cost effective way of getting there. So everybody's working on that. I happen to full disclosure, I happen to be a board member of a California company called Transonic Combustion, which is I think probably probably has the lead now in making HCCI work. That's awesome. Okay, well, I guess we will end with one question from Aaron and Chelsea and I. What is your favorite car of all time? Well, that's that's always a tough question because you have to <laughs> ask the second question, for what? <laughs> ah, yes. Because I've, I've never met uh, a car that, supplies, uh, that serves all needs all the time. And there are times when I I'd, I'd drive my Tahoe and I think, boy, this is the ideal vehicle. Fuel economy, great safety, wonderful visibility, great ride and handling, and so forth. But if you, if if God were to come to me and say, "All right, enough of this various vehicles in your fleet. Uh, you're going to drive one vehicle for the rest of your life and none other. So make take your pick." Uh, my choice would be uh, a Cadillac CTS V station wagon. You know, I that hard to disagree with that one too. Yeah, it, <laughs> it does everything. It it's it elegant, is. It, it's, it's elegant. It's comfortable. It's a family hauler, and it's got 560 horsepower. And you know, if you if you had said just a few years ago that in in a few years you'll be able to go down to your dealership and buy a rear wheel drive, manual transmission. Supercharged, 550 horsepower V8 Corvette engine Cadillac station wagon. Yeah, <laughs> nobody would have believed you. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, there it is. It. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for coming oh, you're on. You're welcome. Thanks very much, and um, put in another plug for the book, and I'll be happy. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Car guys, <laughs> it's it's car guys versus bean counters. If you guys haven't read it yet, you need to. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Good night. You too.
So if you've just joined us, that was the great Bob Lutz. That was fantastic. Oh, my gosh, we got so many questions in. And this is Open Line, our monthly automotive get-together. I'm Michelle Naranjo from Auto by Pell. I am joined by Chelsea Sexton from ChelseaSexton.com and Aaron Bragman from IHS. And we thank GM Inside News, GM Authority, Rumble Strip and BC Auto Geek for co-streaming our show tonight. That was really fun. Lots of questions. Your Lots. conference recording has stopped. Thank you, Betty. And I really, <laughs> really apologize for my Q and A session is over. Thanks, Betty. Wasn't done yet. It, it sounds like you're sitting next to a jet engine. People were wondering I I if, if <laughs> people were wondering if Bob was actually in his Russian fighter hitting the afterburners. I thought earlier when I turned it down to 67 that that would pretty much keep it off. No. <laughs> is it that cold in Long Beach? Burr, Aaron. Oh you know, it is, it's, it's all psychological. You got that Christmas tree in the place, and now you're thinking, oh, now it's winter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is that cold, isn't it, Chelsea? We've, it's sleeping down in the, in the low 40s at night. And that's the part where I have oh, to admit I'm wrapped in an electric oh, blanket. Oh, God. Up oh, no. I know. Yeah. But I have a drafty old house. I had to scrape my car off today. So <laughs> the first I did that this morning from the dew. <laughs> From the dew? The, the dew. dew. We have the dew. things called no, ice. We scrape off our windows. <laughs> Did you use a sponge? <laughs> I know. Ben's, Ben's IMing me. It's 33 in Plymouth. Yeah. Yeah, we're a bunch of weak socks. We know. <laughs> it's uh, cold in California. It was 34 degrees uh, yesterday morning in my driveway. Right? It does get cold here at night. And yeah. we've had that wind, too. Monday morning, yeah. I had to sit there for about five minutes for the defrosters to uh, get the windows clear. I thought it was back east. When I was in L.A. for the auto show um, last month, we went to the uh, the top of the Standard Hotel. There's a bar on the top of the Standard, which is a fantastic bar. And I'm out there in shirt sleeves just enjoying the place, going, God, this feels great. And there's people in scarves and knit hats <laughs> and, puffy, and puffy jackets Parkers. huddled around these fire pits. Just I didn't know California was Alaska now. Oh, uh, you'd think. It's that global warming effect. <laughs> With, well, what I love about what I really love about California is the irony of all these, these emissions laws, and yet there are these propane heaters spewing out greenhouse gas on every every restaurant Everywhere. patio yeah oh, I <laughs> everybody has a fire going in our fireplace yeah uh, <laughs> so yeah we'll do really really well at detroit yeah <laughs> michelle and i will be curled up in the same sleeping bag <laughs> exactly <laughs> now nah, being the auto show in detroit all you have to do is hit up the uh the parties you just drink until you're warm or don't care yeah this is true <laughs> or both or both i still say we moved that show to june Oh, wouldn't that be great? It would be so much better. We'll do it in conjunction. Do it in August. Do it in conjunction with the Dream Cruise, you know? Fine, yes. Make it a a good idea. Make the entire month of August just Automotive Celebration Month in in Detroit. (laughs) Well, the Auto (laughs) Show, (laughs) Dream Cruise, we'll get like the Thunderfest down on the river. Why? Yeah, it's like the old days when they used to, you know, introduce the cars in you know in the fall. You know and, uh, what? We'll get the Grand Prix. We'll and, the Grand and actually Prix take orders at the auto show, you mean? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Tape off the dealership windows and hide yeah. the cars. <laughs> this is going back a little too far. But but you know what? I, I don't have a problem with that. Why don't they do that anymore? Is it really just that marketing has taken over the auto industry so much that it's, that it's not that exciting anymore? I mean, it's, like, it's why the LA Auto Show was so boring. They leaked out yeah. so many cars ahead of time. It, it was boring. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to even go to some of the shows anymore just because you've yeah. seen everything either leaked out ahead of time or if you're part of the media, you've gone to the uh, to the previews that a lot of these automakers have. Like before before the auto show in Detroit, the second week in January, all this thing next week or the week after, like the week of the 14th here, there are – the entire week is filled with GM, Ford, and Chrysler uh, early, like three-week early reviews. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to go and I get to see all the stuff that's going to be unveiled at the auto show the the third week in December. Kind of ruins the surprise. <laughs> yeah. Well, it allows it allows us to go down to the auto show and and broadcast open line there. <laughs> Absolutely, because you know what we want to do is spend a lot of time at Kobo and on the People Mover. Oh yeah, because that's the most exciting part. Is the Can we broadcast mover. live from the People Mover? 
No, you, you can't really actually, wanna, you, you can't really actually, wanna broadcast live from you, the you people. You can't actually movers? hear yourself think on the people movement. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> It yeah, would be really fun for stories, Richie. though. It would, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, boy. We could, we could engage the public. Oh, God. Why would you want yeah, to do that? Yeah, why would you do that? That's People the wrong public to engage. <laughs> 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 I will admit, being being part of the uh, the automotive media and going to the press days, I get, <laughs> I get, I get questions from friends like, hey, we're going to go to the auto show this weekend. You want to come with us? I'm like, are you kidding me? I know. Like go, with the, go with the great unwashed masses. I, there's children running around there. There are dirty hands on the car. No, 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 no. Plus, nobody's serving beer. Mm. Nobody's. Yeah, there, out. there's no drinks. There's no drinks flowing around. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's once you go once you go press, you never want to go to a, a regular public day. When I oh, go to no. on public days in New York, I'm like, eh, you guys go ahead. I'm gonna grab a pretzel and a hot dog. I'll be outside. Exactly. <laughs> I know. You should have seen it at LA Auto Show, Aaron. You would have appreciated this. I drug all the GMI boys to a Chrysler party. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we got questioned at the door. They were like, oh, GM Inside News, what's up with that? Ah, ah, ah. No, like, hey, uh, we, we, got, we have friends all over the place. Come on. I Other know. Just... You know what? Everybody loves you because you guys actually are really balanced for the most yeah. part. Yeah. Fair and balanced, your... GM Inside News. Oh, God, oh, wait, don't wrong, use that term. Wrong title. Oh, well, Sorry. they do have FordInsideNews.com now. We, we do have a Ford Inside News. And we got the, uh, I just, I finally, after being uh, a gun put through my head, finally put up my SRT article and I had to go to, uh, not have to, but I was invited to go see the SRT driving experience uh, over the summer. When did you do really that, great, actually? Really that... great. When did you do that, Al? Sorry? When it was here. Do... It was yep. here in L.A. No, I'm, no, talking, about, no, I'm no. talking about the SRT oh, thing he did. <laughs> that, yeah, was, uh, that was that was that was in the middle of the summer. It was middle of the summer, but it was at English Town Raceway. And oh. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the program, but SRT. When you buy an SRT car, any SRT car, you automatically get enrolled into an SRT driving experience where you spend eight hours a day driving all sorts of SRT cars around various tracks. You go, really? they do a, yeah. yeah, they do an autocross track. Uh, they do, uh, at English town, there's an actually there's a small, I think it's a mile and a half road course and you follow another mile and a half road course and you do like a head to head competition and an autocross track. There's no drag racing. You would think Hemi's and all that stuff would be immediate drag racing. And English town is a very famous dragway. Uh, one of the fastest drag strips in the United States. But there's no drag racing at all, uh, and at the end, we uh, if you won all the competitions, the, the, the three different uh, competitions, um, you got to go for a ride in the Viper ACR Cup and the Viper, actually, the, the, or true Viper car, which they had to fasten a, a passenger seat uh, <laughs> where the fire extinguisher was, and they jammed my rather robust self into that seat. I got to have my face torn off at it. Uh, it felt like 160 you're, miles you're an hour. You're solid, Alex. You're solid. Yeah, come on. You, you yeah, would be I'm, like I'm, me, I'm, who's who bits of skin would be flying off. Yeah, but yeah, you know what? I, I, that that Viper is tight. You don't realize how yeah, tight that Viper yeah. is. It's a big car, yeah. but you sit in that thing. It is narrow. Yeah, even even in factory, I buy an SRT10 off a lot. Sitting yeah. in that passenger seat's very tight. I have friends that race in NASA. Um, not the rocket ship people, the North American Sports Car Association. And uh, he races Corvettes, uh, but his stepfather races Vipers. And he's like, come on, let's go for a ride. I'm like, how am I going to fit in there? And then I, and then, my, and then uh, when I was at the SRT thing, I'm like, no, I, I was in the passenger car. I can just imagine what it's like getting into a race car where there's a roll cage. And But it's, it's surprising. Once you're in it, it's it wasn't as cramped as I thought it was going to be, considering there's a fire extinguisher three inches from my nether regions. Yeah, I think the first time you get in a roll cage, it's I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I ha- the first time I did it, I had a little bit of like a reaction of like, oh, and you're like in a mask and everything. Oh, my God. But then you just kind of go like, okay, why isn't every car built like this? Because I can do anything. <laughs> How much uh, do you have to pay for those days or for those? Oh, the SRT in- thing? Yeah. The SRT thing is, for, if you own an SRT car, you're automatically enrolled. It, 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 it's built into the price of the car. So uh, if you're if you're looking, if you're interested in it, and you have an SRT car, I have a friend that's interested. Uh, have them contact SRT. They they have a, a lot of uh, social media presence. So contact their Facebook, email them, uh, call them, but they'll they'll get you on our enrollment. They they go around the United States, so it's not just in New Jersey. It, uh-huh. it, they go every they go around some really great tracks, yeah, and they have a full on team. 
I was Sorry? just on one for the CTSV. They had, uh, of course, you had to pay for it, but it was like seven hundred, but. Seven hundred fifty. No, it was, I'm sorry. It was five hundred fifty-six dollars. Oddly enough. Uh, so, uh, of course, interesting. You know where they got that number from? <laughs> but it was uh, it was at Pahrump, Nevada, which I didn't know existed, which is about a hour probably east, uh, or I'm sorry, west of uh, Las Vegas. But uh, it uh, was it Spring Mountain Raceway, I believe it was. It was a great time all day. You know. Yeah, I think they had uh, what's his name, uh, the CTS driver for the uh, series. The was it the Grand Americans or whatever the one the Cadillac. Oh, Andy on. Pilgrim. Yeah, Andy. No, the. Um, or is it uh, Johnny O'Connell? Johnny O'Connell, who's a great guy. Yeah. He's great an awesome guy. dude. He's an awesome dude. And uh, you know, you got to drive him, and you had somebody tutoring you. Of course, it was the first time I was ever on a racetrack, so but it was great. You know, they were great with you, and you got a little bit of. Uh, time with the vehicles you got you used to them and you spent a good bit of seat time with them it was, it was great did you walk away feeling like you were a better driver afterwards oh much better driver of course my time showed it and my <laughs> a lot less uh break 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 and uh, yeah, the, the co-driver you can kind of tell how you're good or bad you're doing is how much they're, they're trying not to yell at you but uh it was a great time i'll tell you it was the best 500 bucks i ever spent and it's really. I got to go. Uh, they do. They do something. Uh, something similar for the media, and they had it up in Monticello Raceway up in New York. And, All uh, right. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. They were. They had a couple of guys that are talking about that. Yeah. It, it's. I mean, it's that's that's a really beautiful racetrack. Um, I've, I've had a, I've had a chance to go. I, I saw Mr. Lux go ahead and race against the uh, Auto Blogosphere a couple. Was it two, three years ago now? Up in Monticello, that was really interesting to see. Uh, Everybody the all, all the stuff. I remember that, yeah. That CTSV yeah, that, that was, is that an awesome stuff. car. I, I have that to agree good. with Bob's choice of the CTSV yes. wagon. Yeah, if you, if you're going to choose one vehicle that's that's an all-around amazing piece of work that does a lot of very yeah. good things very Actually, well. Actually, from the talking to the guys, because there was, I don't know how many people were there, but it was full, full up. But uh, that was actually probably the, it was right there with the coupe, and I was number one pick is, what everybody wanted, liked the best was the wagon. It's just it's dramatic styling. Yeah. It, it just it's, it's looks amazing. so dramatic. The, the, the first time I ever drove that, I actually, I was at Texas Motor Speedway, and I pulled back into the garage, and I had to look behind to see that I was actually driving the wagon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the great part about it. Fun. You got all that performance, and you can actually put the groceries in that thing and just take them off. Yeah, they won't yeah. be in any condition to eat when you get home, but, you know. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> all yeah, them tight so they don't move around. Just don't buy any <laughs> eggs. Buy only frozen <laughs> food. Yes. Yeah. I, I think uh, someone said it was uh, perfect, and I, I always bring it up every time, every time somebody brings it up. Is, uh, the CTSV wagon is the exact car that an auto journalist would buy if they were had some sort of secret trust fund. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 your, it's your manual transmission, super powerful engine, rear-wheel drive, great looks, and a wagon. I mean, you, you can't beat that. Yeah. Oh, right, but that's just like the, the, Magnum, the Magnum wagon, right? Yeah. 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 The SRT8 Magnum. Well, well, that's, look when, I, when I went to that SRT event, there was actually, a, there was, and, I, and I, I hate to sound sexist, and it wasn't sexist. That I, I didn't mean to come off that way. But we were, you do. When we were transporting, there was uh, an older lady in the front of the van, and she was talking about her Magnum. And I was like, oh, do you have uh, an RT, or what do you have? She goes, no, no, I have an SRT Magnum. Mm-hmm. I go, did you drive an SRT Magnum? I go, that is the most – I'm like, how many kids do you have? She goes, I have three kids. I was like, why didn't you buy – you know, I, I, I asked the question just to see what her reaction was. I go, why didn't you buy an SUV like 99.99% every other mom? She goes, why would I want an SUV when I can have like a 400-plus a horsepower station wagon? I was like, that, I go, I wish you were my mom. That's the coolest mom, mom in the world right there. My, Although, my, mom bought a, my, my mom bought a town and country, you know, when I was – 13 I, I was upset I, but you know i didn't have a chance my mom didn't have a chance to buy a 400 plus horsepower you, station you wagon. were lucky man i grew up in b-body wagons we had a caprice classic wagon for 10 years and then my folks Ooh. sold it and wanted to buy something different so they bought the oldsmobile custom cruiser the custom cruiser <laughs> they have wow. the, they have, they have the windows in the ceiling and we call that the vista roof yes it had yeah, the vista, it had the vista roof, roof. Yes. and that was the wrong b-body wagon I am I am honestly rather dismayed to hear Bob Lutz talk about the Pontiacs that would have been. No. 
Oh, That's I know, what I was right? trying yeah. to ask him. I was kind of, kind of thinking more of the Opal. You yeah. know, since Opals are going to sell them better in Europe anyway, and you got to pay a gazillion dollars to these people to build them. I and, would, I would not be surprised you know. if we saw an Opal based off of the uh, the platform, the Alpha platform that's doing that's underneath the ATS, the Cadillac ATS. Right, because yeah, yeah, the ATS would, that's a huge market in Europe. Yeah, the, I mean, you're going to get that. Yeah, you're, you're, get you're not, you're not, you're not going to see Opal on ATS unless there's. Uh, that would be for it would be have to be made in the United States one, which yeah. Europeans don't like. Well, uh, number two, Cadillac. Cadillac will not just like they had with Sigma, because that was the problem with Sigma. The current Cadillac is that Sigma was supposed to be shared across several right. uh, across everybody. Uh, Holden was the first one to push it away, and once Cadillac really kind of had a handle on it, they said, "Oh no, no, this is our chassis. You guys yeah. stick to your four-wheel drive nonsense. Yeah. This is I'm ours." I'm just thinking a way Cadillac, that they can Cadillac make take Opal work. You know how they can make well, Opal Apple, work without. Opal has the know. cars. Opal has some fantastic cars. I mean, if you've yeah, driven yeah. the Regal GS, I mean, absolutely fantastic car. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I wish car. they brought the. If I, I wish they brought the the Astro OPC here. Oh, yeah. The yeah, 280 yeah. They may yet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, you know, we, if you make well, the, the three series like Opal in Europe and sell it in Europe, you could also, you know, in the ASON uh, countries, you can make them in Malaysia and sell them there. The Opal brand or Buick, whichever one you know, works you can, better. You can sell. You can really build matter. the Opal. You can build the Opal here and sell it over there because the well, exchange should, the but, exchange rate right now. Right. Well, the on, problem on is you get to deal with the unions. Europeans and, don't buy it. Europeans will not yeah. buy a, a, an Americanized Opal. No. They, 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 they will not to wrap their mind around it. And on top yeah. of that, Cadillac won't right. allow it. Because if Cadillac wants yeah, to be in man. Europe, if Opal's going to get the same car with possibly, you know, different features, or, or, like, then you're, then you're eating into train, small, you know. Yeah, but you know, talking you're, with you're, Don, you're talking, to, talking, talking with Don Butler at Cadillac, they Cadillac has no real aspirations for European growth. They are not focusing he, on Europe. They are going to Europe because you you basically yeah. have to be there. Is he the guy to, talking about being a boutique brand or? Uh, I don't I don't think so. I, I actually I sat market. I remember I seeing that article out. about that. I sat and talked with uh, with him. He's the vice president for Cadillac Marketing North America, and I sat and talked with him pretty at length for uh, a report they did for the company. And they really do not have aspirations for Europe. They understand that the Europeans. Right. They they understand. Hang on. They understand that the Europeans basically don't want an American luxury brand. Right, they don't. Yeah, Alex is right. They, they don't want to. Buy, they won't yeah. buy because we we sell product in Europe and well actually we have a lot of places in, in Germany, France and in in uh Scotland. And yeah, you pay the piper for the, the labor and yeah, they good God they get the vacation time, believe me. Oh, See yeah. it on our company calendar. I'm not sure when they're ever there, but uh it's but you know, that's that's the way they do business. They don't care, they'll pay the price to have a German made, German uh built car and that's just the way they kinda are and I know that it's kind of button heads with what you know the head people at General Motors kind of have a vision for, but uh, I'm just thinking if you make the three series into an Opal, I don't know Senator or whatever the you know, name they used to have, or yeah, uh, it's bigger than what a Manta would be, but you you would sell a decent amount there and kind of offset that you're you're kind of stuck with the four plants in Germany, so you kind of kind of get figured well. You don't really want to make cheap ash, you know, not cheap Astras, but low profit Astras. I mean, you can make them in Poland, which is a lot better place to make them cost-wise. And you know, if you make the three series, well, I keep saying three series, but <laughs> I know, right? You get you get the idea that yeah, the type of, because they sell the crap out of them things yeah. over there. And uh, you know, you get the volume to kind of offset it. They'll make a they'll make a dime on them, and you know, you can ex, you know export you know expand the model across the range, you know, make it be a great Buick, you know. I'd rather see it as a Pontiac, yes, but you know, it'd still make a great Buick. And I kind of think you got to – the only reason it'd be better for the Buick, you can get the you know more sales volume. Chevy is is great, but you know, you don't kind of want to contaminate the Chevy. The good news you got with the Cruze, the Echo, the high mileage, because you know the the general public gets confused pretty quick. So, you know, you hit them with this, you know, this is a great Chevy Cruze, which is getting great traction, great car, and the Malibu will follow it up. But then you slap his sports sedan in it as a Chevy, and it's like, well, 
is it high mileage car or is it a performance car? <laughs> well, well, Chevy has the ability to kind of be. Uh, I think G. It's the only real brand that GM has that's broad based. Buick is focused. GMC is focused. Cadillac is focused. Right. Uh, Chevrolet can be like what Ford is doing, and Ford is really kind of running the whole. I mean, they're they're expanding pretty far. I mean, a Taurus SHL fully loaded is close to forty thousand dollars. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, and that, that offers pretty much every feature that the, the Lincoln does with with more power. Um, right. I think Chevrolet uh, having a performance. I mean, obviously Chevrolet's performance. You don't have to sell that. It's been around for fifty years. They've made a hundred that hundred million small block Chevys. Imagine a hundred million small block Chevys. Oh yeah. So performance, Chevrolet performance. They're now positioned themselves to now have this eco ride with the Volt, right. Sonic, Cruise, uh, and now the Spark. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's that, obviously that, that working. Too. Yeah, I mean that that needs to be there because they can't be caught with their pants down around their ankles again if gas but hits five, six, seven dollars a oh, gallon. Yeah, you got to cover your bets. And that, and the good news is they they drive great and they look great. So that you know they. They really got that. I think they really got that part of it nailed. Really, that's that's why I don't want to. You, you don't really kind of mess with that. Of course, on the flip side, I think like a one series, which I think the new one series that's going to come out pretty soon is really a, a much better uh, fit. And maybe that would be a perfect Chevy. You know, you get maybe the little one point yeah. six turbo in that thing at uh, like twenty two thousand oh, dollars, and you know, for the people that want it, and that you could all which. To sell as an Opel, or, well, Chevy, like you say, it ain't gonna work as a Chevy in Europe. It'll work as well. An well, Opel. well, yeah. What, what, what would be what's gonna be funny is this, uh, what I'm looking forward to see is how Holden's gonna do because as of right now, uh, the Cruise is is on track to outsell hold the, the Commodore, which has been the yeah, number that's one gonna be car. interesting. <laughs> so, but it, so the, as the rear wheel drive car now, Ford has already said they're done. Rear wheel drive is done in that's Australia, and they're gonna get it. They're going to get a next generation for uh, uh, Fusion, and they're going to get a next generation for Taurus. Um, so Holden has said they're going to stick to rear wheel drive. Now, with that, right. uh, it's very possible Holden has done it before. Uh, they get some of the scraps left over from other parts of GM when they took uh, over Opel's rear wheel drive program, where we had the Katara. Opel or Holden took that, modified it heavily, and developed the VY cars, which turned into the Pontiac GTO, which we know. But at the time, they had the, they had the Monaro, uh, Monaro and right. things like that. I, I think that um, if Holden gets their hands on a local uh, a Alpha, which is this, this sub this this platform that Cadillac has, right? There were there is going to be a cheaper, a slightly cheaper version of it for Camaro. Camaro will also ride on Alpha, but this this new Cadillac chassis. Right. Which I think that's, that's a great you finally get it to the right size. <laughs> Rick, and I forgot. Camaro is great, but it's just too big. Rick, I forgot what is what was what do you do in the industry? Because I can't remember. I know you've called in and told us before, and I'm sorry. Uh, I'm in the aerospace industry. Okay. So we we're, He's we're a rocket uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't make rocket. Our company does, but we our our particular plant doesn't. But yeah, we we got. In fact, we just bought a plant in. Australia, a company in Australia that actually makes fuel injection for uh, the little uh, drones, of all things. It's all kind of, you know, some of the bizarre things that they, they come up with. But. Well, did you guys hear about this conference that um, NASA actually held recently that was um, open for all industry, and it was quite heavily focused towards the automotive industry, where all of the aerospace and aeronautics and all of that stuff, industry employees that have developed different technologies were being opened up as sort of like, you know, potentially able to contribute to other industries because they're trying to, you know, replace employees and engineers and uh, ideas. Engineer, and they don't make engineers anymore. That model well, has been discontinued. you know, part of it was they were talking about like some of the um, technology that's behind um, the, the I don't know what you'd call it, the area that surrounds the engines on on rockets and jet planes and all that, right. that's like kind of impenetrable and what that could do for car safety. There were different metallic alloy things that were going to be um, really useful on those the machinery and the plants for um, the automotive industry for putting together, you know, high temperature 
uh, oh, yeah. we do you know, well, all of that stuff. And and it's sort of like the whole industry because NASA shut down. There's all these people that are unemployed, oh, and it's yeah. actually going to inform the automotive industry more and more and more. Oh yeah, we we well we make the engine that sells for for just about every jet commercial jetliner in the world. So Michelle, what you're saying is that eventually, we, pretty soon, we can expect to actually see flying rocket cars. Well, you know, we're just going to make Elon Musk happy, right? Because we're oh, all God. going to be booking time at his uh, at his space. electric rockets. <laughs> electric rockets. It's only a matter of time before you know. No time soon. <laughs> electric rockets. I can't wait to get into my jet. He's committed to doing a new car every year. But. Yeah, some of that stuff he was talking about with uh, with Via Motors. I mean, that's something that uh, we would probably be able to do that with uh, our uh, actuation oh, yeah. systems and stuff that we do that that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, that's a very interesting idea. I think with in the pickup truck, I like the idea with the contractors and you know being out in the. I think that that's probably that'd be a great idea for actually GM's next generation pickups. Well, Chelsea, there was, was cool Chelsea, idea. wasn't there um, a an a, a limited edition of EV1 um, Silverado engines made? Um, the S10 was also done with the EV1 propulsion system. That's but there, right. are, there right. are a number of companies that are doing exactly what he's talking about. He is the latest. Interestingly, they have a fair to middling reputation in the world. <laughs> it's, a, it's definitely an odd choice of, of companies to go consult for. Uh, but it's one of a handful that are trying to do this conversion by fleet because on one hand people are impatient to wait for new cars to penetrate new evs to penetrate the market at that well, pace and want to do something with the old one well there's, there's the cost but the conversions can be more expensive than a whole new car so right. there's it's always a mix there i mean uh, for a startup to do a whole car i mean it's always better you know the suspension and everything works together because it's amazing you wouldn't believe how much time and money is expended on just how a car stops and rises and the balance of it and just the, oh, it's, all it's, the stuff. Oh, no, question. More than that, it's, it's, even, it's even like how does the window lift regulators work reliably oh, yeah. or how does the seat ratchet work properly? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, it's so much of that. You just, ask, yeah. uh, just ask Tesla. <laughs> right. Right. And you've probably seen course. some of the GM videos with how they tested the vault through deep water and all that stuff, and it's yeah. just amazing how much stuff. For sure, but at the same time, it, with a lot of these conversions, by the time you bastardize them enough to make, a, make them a plug-in, you have messed with the majority of that anyway. So yeah. conversions can be a very streamlined way, streamlined way to go. They can also be very problematic. But because there's so much lack of trust of one-off conversions in the industry, there are companies that have seen the path. Basically, it started with the, the Prius. And when a few companies had success doing Prius conversion kits to plug in hybrids, other companies went, oh, yeah, maybe they, maybe we do it that way. And yeah, one the one on the road did that. I remember seeing a, this Prius plug-in going up and down the road about every about once a week I'd see it come up, you know, with all the test wires going around it. And yeah, stuff. yeah. A123 had did the biggest uh, b- biggest job of that. But a bunch of the former Tesla engineers in Michigan went off and started a very similar company that's doing the same thing. They have Chrysler management on their board. So there's a little bit of competition there. What company yeah. is that? Alt-E. Oh, really? I didn't know they were ex-Tesla. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but I think GM could use that Volt idea and their next pickup kind of counter forward, you know, Echo Boost thing kind of. Plus, give you more uh, market for the Volt stuff. But I tell you what, they've got to they got to do something to counter EcoBoost because right now Ford yeah. is making a lot of hay with EcoBoost. Yeah. Well, they, you know, it's, well, EcoBoost is a marketing term at this point. I mean, GM has EcoBoost. They just don't market it. They've had no, EcoBoost they, since 2006. Uh, they just don't market it. What? Huh? I mean, well, what, what, is, what is EcoBoost? It's what Ford. Ford says it's direct injection turbocharging. Gasoline GM has two, back, turbo. Yeah, you, GM had it that, that in the Cobalt SS, Solstice, right. and any of the two-liter that, turbos. That, that, that. The, L, the LNF motor has been around since 2006, 2007. Single, single turbo, yeah. The, the the actual V6s are twin turbos. Well, and well, they'll tell well, you that it's, well, it's yeah, actually well, more than well, just well, a... Well. They'll tell you that it's actually more than just the engine. It's an actual calibration oh, yeah, between the engine the and the transmission. Thing. It's 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 more. It goes beyond just having a turbo engine. But it is. I mean, it is uh, largely a marketing issue. It it's, is largely. It's, it's, it's a big. It's a. It's a more. It's it's like saying Vortec. It's it's something to put on there because they have Eco uh, Eco Boost uh, four cylinders, the two liter turbo that's going to be right. in the uh, right. Focus right. SP. I mean, two that's, liter, right. 
Yeah, they have the two-liter turbo, which is, I mean, uh, displacement and technology-wise, no turbo, more, yeah. no less advanced than uh, than what what's, than what was in the 2006 yeah. Cobalt yeah, I SS. I think the numbers are it's about that, the same as the Ford Cobalt would, SS, aren't they? Ford the would disagree yeah, with you. <laughs> so far, I'm sure Ford would disagree with me. But that's the point is, is that EcoBoost, I think, is more of, um, I mean, yeah, there might be some fine-tuning, but it, if, you, if you look at EcoBoost, you can, yes, you can get really good gas mileage. If you stay out, if you stay off the pedal, if, if you're not as hard on it, but as soon as you start romping on it to get some of the power right. out of it, but your, you your do, gas mileage stops there. down to the. <laughs> yeah, we have, to, exactly. we, have to, we have to remember what EcoBoost was originally called when they introduced that concept that had the twin turbo GTDI motor in it. It was called Twin Force. It yeah. was not oh, called EcoBoost. Oh, yeah. was, and they called it Twin Force internally for a long time until they realized, oh shit, gas is suddenly four dollars. <laughs> yeah, you a gotta gallon. get the echo in there somewhere. You should call it something else because you know, look, look at the Ford Taurus show. It's a four thousand pound, three hundred and eighty horsepower, all wheel drive, twin turbo, American huge family sedan, and only Americans could put an eco badge on something like that. Right. You know. <laughs> No, it's yeah, eco. I mean, it's, yeah, no, it's eco because it has turbos and, and direct right. injection, and that, right, that's right. that's the basic gas. Is there any real but numbers originally, on what? Originally, it was called Twin Force, and it was meant twin to take the place force. of the V8s. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. like well, I think yeah, the, yeah. until the V8s were like, uh, yeah, until they redesigned the whole cylinder head for the Ford V8, and they were like, oh wow, we found all this extra power we haven't found in 20 years. Let's go ahead and roll yeah, with that. Get, the alternator out of the way, and you can actually get the plugs out without taking yeah. it out of the head with it. But I tell you what, well, for a we'll, we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out how hard those spark plugs are to get out. You still got to use that stupid oh. tool. I have, a, I have a coworker has an Ecoline van, and he he's gonna he's planning on trading it in when it needs the plugs changed. Yeah, yeah. Smart <laughs> man. He's not Smart even gonna mess man. with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, I mean, uh, I think I think I think EcoBoost is definitely a hell of a marketing move for a Ford. Oh yeah. And, I mean, I mean, yeah. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to him. Okay, it's it's some engine and, and transmission tuning. Yeah, but could yeah, GM the, kind of do that with the uh, Equinox or the Terrain? Just slap, you know, put the L on that. The, the you already got it in the Regal GS. Just slap that. Well, you yeah, know, I, I the... when I drove, I, I got to drive the Equinox uh, three liter uh, front wheel drive, and I, and I and while I like the three liter, I think it has plenty of power. I mean, it, it, it yeah. meets the standard. You just gotta get on, you gotta lean on it a little bit, but it does. Have uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's not it's not terrible, but my my thing is the three liter overall is just kind of in the, in the middle ground it's either as far as the, the the mile per gallon i got was a little under 21 i had a right. similar amount of uh, fuel economy out of a front wheel drive the new 2012 srx with the 3.6 that had while it was heavier had a lot more power right. or i could go and go with the two liter turbo that makes a hell of a lot more torque and get a significant amount more fuel economy so the right. three liter turbo the three liter engine uh, won't really come in a, until we start seeing the, this, the, the new upcoming 3-liter twin turbo from GM, which yeah. we should see probably in the next 18 months. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Once once we get a that, Camaro or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be an alpha. It's gonna be alpha ready. Alpha, right. it'll, be an, it'll be it'll be an ATS. Uh, it'll, it'll hopefully be in some of the other yeah. front-wheel drive. Well, that's what the 3 Series has, right? It's a 3-liter turbo, right? It's a straight right. six, I mean, but still a 3-liter turbo. I think I think that that they're I mean they're they're projecting horsepower from the 350 to 400 range. I mean it's okay. it's definitely something they can put in. Um, I mean into some of their trucks, uh, something they can put in maybe some of the, the Lambda cars. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean it, it, there's definitely a lot of a lot of capacity there, but I I, I wouldn't look for it in a Malibu or a Regal. If, if people are getting right. excited, people are like, oh, you know, a proper Regal GS. Everyone uh, gets upset that the Regal GS didn't come with a Turbo Six or yeah. Something else insane, but um, yeah, nah, nice I, I they have a three point six in it though. I mean, the Camry kind of. I think Toyota kind of surprised people with when they put the new. The, they kept the six in the Camry. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, Toyota's just playing it safe. They have they have a solid lineup, and they really didn't change as far as engineering wise. I mean, nothing's chassis wise brand yeah. new for the Camry. It's mostly it looks technology. a good bit more different than I thought it would. Yeah, I've seen yeah. it. Well, obviously out here in California, you see them everywhere. Well, the yeah. interior, yeah, the yeah, interior on the new ones. The interior on the new ones is really disappointing. Oh, is it? Yeah, I haven't seen the They've interior. taken even more content out of the Camry, and the interior is, is garbage. I gotta I, say. I'm yeah. not the only person who will say this. I thought the new interior of the Camry looked nicer than the old one. Mm. No, I, I, I can't. Bang, I don't I know, like I didn't like color. grab the interior and start checking how it felt. It just looked nice to me. What kind really? of journalist? 
Because even the design of it, I didn't think looked. An odd better. journalist, Alex. Come on, you should know this <laughs> yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I don't like the fang tail lights. There was a bunch of there was a bunch of them at at um, at Impa's, uh spring break rally, and everybody was tearing the crap out. They had they had a hybrid out there. Um, I mean, they had a couple different versions out. I mean, the, the thing hybrid. with the Camry is that the hybrid wasn't bad. But the thing with the Camry, yeah, if you want to compare stats to stats, the Regal GS doesn't have the 280 horsepower V6, and right. that's great. But the, the Mal, the, the, the uh, I'm sorry, the um, the Camry doesn't drive nearly as well, not even in the same category as the Regal GS. I mean, yeah, the Regal's a great car. so much fun. I haven't driven a GS, but the tur- I've driven the turbo and the base car, but that. It- you can see, you can feel the European uh, heritage underneath there. I, I, I gotta say, we we got to drive a couple of pre-production car. We got to drive a pre-production car around uh, Milford Proving Grounds, uh, and and then I just got done testing it a couple of weeks ago, uh, right around Thanksgiving time. And I gotta say, that is that is a great car. I mean, the power from the Turbo Four is fantastic. Uh, the, the, the hyperlink suspension. The, right. the uh, I mean everything was great. I, I mean the, it, they they couldn't have done a better job. They put a V6 in it, it would have destroyed everything. I didn't like the two eight. I didn't like the two eight turbo front and the SRX I had last year of the tester. Uh, yeah, I didn't think it would make yeah. a difference. Yeah. I, I, the fuel economy and it was. It was yeah, I think cool. you're right on that. You know, people get, just tend to get into them and. Yeah, you because know, the power's there, it kind of gets addicting after a while. And you know, next, you know, when you first start out, yeah, you're getting 25 miles. The next thing you know, you're barely getting 20 because you can't keep your foot out of the dang thing. I'll admit that's my problem with the EcoBoost motors is that I uh, actually my favorite vehicle to have that in is the Flex. The Flex yep. EcoBoost is an absolute riot to drive. Oh, is it? It is. It is. I like the flex to begin with. I like the big, silly, stupid-looking wagon style of the thing. And yeah, that styling's definitely. Uh, it got even unique. more polarizing with the new one too. The new one in, in LA yeah. is even more wild and out there. But oh, you put the EcoBoost motor in that thing, and it's expensive as hell. You're pushing almost forty-five grand, but it is just so MKT much fun. MKT too. MKT. It's like I, I had a, a customer of mine, and, uh, and he had a fully loaded EcoBoost uh, MKT. Mm-hmm. And I want to say that that came near seventy thousand dollars. Wow! It was like sixty, high sixties. I was like, really? That she, she, uh, her, his wife had went from a Charger SRT8 to a Roush Mustang, which broke in about a month and a half. The transmission went out. Uh, it blew yeah, out. I mean, he, he's he's a race car driver, so I'm sure he he had his way with it. But uh, but then he bought he bought his wife an MKT EcoBoost. And then when she came in, she goes, this thing's kind of fast. I'm like, did you get the twin turbo one? She's like, oh, I don't know. And I looked at the back. I'm like, yeah, this is the twin turbo, you know, eco, uh, the eco boost car. She's like, oh, well, this thing is so fast. I, I go everywhere. It gets like five miles a gallon, but I don't care. I go everywhere really fast. It's fun. It's pretty fun. Five miles a gallon. Actually, the Ford I like is I, I like the Edge. I think, I think that's a nice size vehicle, which is basically the same size as the Equinox. But yeah. I think those yeah. are pretty nice. I, uh, I, I, I wonder how many people are walking in the showrooms and look at the Flex and then look at Explorer and they just hit a little bit higher ride height and they go Explorer. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I don't know if Ford – I know Ford Cal, but they said oh, 25% of the Flex sales were in Southern California. Mm-hmm. I think during the LA Auto Show they said something, some some factor like that, 20 25%. Yeah. Um, oh, that's pretty high. Yeah, yeah it's, so it's I guess a it's, a, it's a stylish. It's, I mean, it's, it's a style thing. I mean, I guess conventional thought would be, well, here's a wagon-looking vehicle, and here's an SUV built on relatively the same platform. Right. Uh, I, I, I'm surprised that Ford has kept with the Flex. I think conventional conventional thought would say, uh, we have two cars eating about the same amount of space right. in the showroom. Why won't? Why don't we just kill the one that's selling at a third or a quarter of the rate? So I'm after a while, you got to amortize the cost of the tooling for a while, so you just kind of keep making them. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. Know, you just but, play, but, but, let the thing play out. It, to put money back into it and redesign. I mean, it, it wasn't a major yeah. redesign interior-wise, no. and I, I, I can't remember if the interior got any major updates. But I did, what I did think was funny is that there are there's only one Ford badge on the entire car now. Yeah, it's just black I, actually, yeah. I like that, yeah. actually. I think that's really nicer that way now. Yeah, come to think, I do see a decent amount of them out here, so they must be. They, I guess, they sell pretty good. Of course, you know, it's not like they sell three hundred thousand of them a year, but right. 
What do you guys think of the new God's Dot? Oh, hey, I love Jonathan. I like hey, that thing. I I, you know, I actually do love that little thing. The pictures I've seen of the dart, really they they, cool. they look good. That racetrack rear lighting, the rear LED oh, lighting, yeah, that's, just... that's fantastic. It's one of the most distinctive things about the Charger. You yeah. could pick a Charger out from a oh. mile away on the highway. And I, I hope you know, I if it drives crazy. anything like the neons. The neons were fun little things to drive, really. They were. They were. Yeah. yeah. Not that they were most reliable cars in the world, but uh, yeah, they were fun as hell to drive. Somebody out there needs to turn their uh, speaker down on their computer because we're getting feedback. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. I can hear myself, and I shouldn't have to hear myself. Mine's off. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I remember well, years ago in the '90s, I actually sold the uh, Dodges, and I ordered a. They had the uh, I forget what the SCC. They had a race version of it, which was kind of funky because it had the camber all funky, right? Sold that thing in a week. Couldn't believe it. I, I, you know, I ordered. I used to order all kind of bizarre things, and I kept, cut all kind of hell. Nobody will buy that. And you know, some of the there was about two vehicles I never did see. They came in, they PMI'd them, they got them on the lot, and they sold within like three days. But you know, so if, you know, you couldn't order fifty of them. But it was a, a guy drove in from I think it was up from like Bakersfield down and bought the thing. Just mm. came down, drove it, and bought it. But I that thing forward, was a blast to drive. With that I look suspension. forward to seeing the uh, the whole dart, not just the front and back end, in the, in the next couple of right. weeks. We're, we're going to see the interior next. Apparently, according you can actually go to dodge dot com slash dart, right. and they've got a couple yeah. more pictures up there, and uh, they've got a schedule for when they're going to show the interior and when they're going to oh, do. Oh really? It. Yeah. Yeah. All part. I look at all part sometimes. It has some decent. It has some good information on it, but. Yeah, it looks like. I mean, the interior looks pretty decent. I mean, it doesn't look. Yeah, it doesn't look like yeah, the old Avenger. It doesn't look cheesy anyway. Yeah, it looks like. Uh, yeah, I think there's a couple of spy shots of the interior of, yeah. that someone snapped not too long ago. I think it looks pretty good. It's got. Uh, it's got Dodge's kind of cockpit design. Yeah, um, right. yeah, which I, I, I like I look, actually. Yeah, I think I think it'll do pretty good. Um, yeah, it's good I, competition. I think. Uh, I, 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 think it, I, I always had my, my always my opinion on whole Chrysler when they came out of bankruptcy is that. They went a different route. Is that they instead of putting money in towards an eco car or developing an electric vehicle, or like GM did, or uh, Ford kind of oh, Ford didn't really get a bailout or anything like that, but they had to adjust they, their image. Oh wait 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 wait. Uh, wait. Thank you. <laughs> they they actually did. They did. Well, they, they, they got they got a couple billion dollars. Sure. Yes, they did. Right. They did. Uh, and they, 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 they didn't did. have to sit in front of it and, and beg. Before yeah. everybody else did, yeah. so they basically they asked early, so they got good press. Oh yeah, they 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 they, they mortgaged their whole company. I, I mean, I, I could go so blue in the face about that whole lot, but right. I, I guess more, getting back to Chrysler is that they they seem to just they were like you know instead of bringing out a new car, we're gonna clean house, throw away the garbage we don't need, and we're gonna put new interiors and everything else that we're gonna keep. And yeah. I thought that was at the time I was like. Well, you have GM now that is just is literally burning cash, and trying to get the the crews out. They're trying to get the Volt out. They're going to try to get the Sonic to be made in the United States. All right. pushing 40 plus miles per gallon. You have Malibu coming out soon. You have, you have this big push towards electrification, e assist stuff. And then right. here comes Chrysler. It's like, oh yeah, no, we're going to remite, we're going to remodel our rear wheel drive cars. Yeah. Uh, we're going to make Ram its own brand. Uh, we're gonna have an all new Durango and new Hemi's and and all new interiors. Well, some of the stuff, yeah, stuff, you know, some of the the stuff that Chrysler, some of the stuff that Chrysler did, like such as you're talking about the rear wheel drive cars, the new Durango, uh, the Grand Cherokee, a lot of that was done before Cerberus even got on the scene. I remember going to a, a, yeah. a preview at the Design Dome over in Auburn Hills. I saw the new Charger. I saw the new 300 about two years before they actually came out. They were oh. delayed because of the bankruptcy. Yeah. Right. So a lot of that work was already done. To me, the more impressive thing is what Chrysler was able to do with everything else. All right. of the new interiors, the new Journey, frankly, I think gets oh, passed yeah. over a lot. But the yeah. Journey – has a complete change, and and the Chrysler yeah. 200 too. The yeah, 200 the may not look a lot of different, but almost every bit of the suspension was modified in that thing. Uh-huh. New powertrains, new interiors, and it's 
people look at it and go, well, it still looks like a Sebring. A little bit, but you know what? It looks considerably better, yeah. and the sales that's numbers a, they have on this thing yeah, I couldn't believe that. I wonder how many of those are fleet, but still. Yeah, that's the, the big question. No. It's like, how many it's, is that fleet? It's, yeah. it's yeah, not that's... fleet. It's the entire thing. Their retail sales are up 54%. Right. Yeah, my, yeah. my brother in law. Chrysler the just, company or Chrysler the brand? Chrysler the brand. Yeah, the the right. 200 wow. specifically is astonishing. They used to sell, I did some calculations. That was a killer when was, rad they had. When I was talking about Chrysler back in the in the in the the nasty dark days, that that was they actually had a, a calculated a figure, wherein they sold one Chrysler Sebring sedan less than one Chrysler less than one Chrysler Sebring sedan per month per dealer, wow. during the the bad old days. They're now up to I think right around two a week, which you think is yeah. you know better anyway. Well, they well, doubled consider, it. Come on, that's an improvement right there. <laughs> Camry sells five a week. <laughs> Oh, yeah. well, look, Believe me, I know the difference. Yeah. When I used Pretty to sell dealer. cars, it was a Honda and Dodge dealer with yeah. all things. And Bleach. you know, we'd sell. We had the Spirit out there, if you remember that. Mm-hmm. And you know, you would sell one Spirit a month, maybe, and we would sell like nine Accords a week, and it was just amazing. You know, it's like how many, yeah. you know. In the old 93 Accords, you couldn't believe. We almost had fist fights on the dealer lot for a used. 93 Accord with 30,000 miles on them. And you couldn't drag them to look at an Intrepid if you put a gun to their head, in, That's even funny. though they could get it for cheaper. Yeah. But uh, if, once you get the – but then I came in and got some better vehicles, colors and that in there. But we started selling them once people drove them. It wasn't a bad driving car, the Intrepid. That thing was – Pretty, no, actually, pretty good driver. Oh, the, L- the LH cars. Oh, they're they're fantastic. LH. They have lower design. Yeah, I yeah, have I a lot. Oh, the best from a style best, standpoint. Uh, rainy day car you can drive. They're amazing in the rain. Absolutely yeah. phenomenal. I know. I thought the styling of of all the the cab forward vehicles looked fantastic to me. Yeah, yeah, they were definitely. They, Chrysler tends to have like this every five or six years. Uh, uh, they have like this huge. Design Renaissance, like I remember when when the chart when the 300 came out and the Magnum oh, yeah. came out and the Charger came out, I mean that really blew people's minds. And everyone was like, "Oh, this is it!" You know, Chrysler's yeah. back on the map. This is how they're going to get back. And then they kind of trickled off, and the Avenger came out and Sebring yeah, came out, and you're like, much. "Oh, what the hell just <laughs> happened?" Yeah, but then, I remember going to. Uh, I actually went to customer uh, preview or uh, what do you call? Uh, we call a test market thing for the 300. Well, actually, it was the Magnum, but the 300, as soon as I seen it, I was like, holy cow, that's the car you need. I need to build. And, of course, they did build both of them, yes. which you don't know in those events what they're actually going to build. Then about a year later, I went to the Avenger one, and it was like, what the hell happened? I mean, what happened to the guys that did the 300? Exactly. <laughs> and then, <laughs> we saw, then we saw a teaser of that 200 show car. Oh, that 200, 200 show car was beautiful. It was That's gorgeous. Right. It was yeah. the car that the that was the car that the Sebring should have been. Right, rear wheel drive yeah. too, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was basically based well, off the Challenger. It was an electric car. Didn't that some sort of hybridization? Yeah, that was supposed to be a well, hybrid. Of course, I think they just slapped that in there. Yeah, yeah. Was the well, was, I think Dodge, yeah, Dodge had a lot of quick electric vehicles that never yeah. materialized to anything. Yeah, I think they're, like they were talking, was you know, saying before they were just kind of something that they just. I sat down the road and have somebody slap an electric motor in it. I mean, all of us knew that those EVs they had out there were just was just baloney. I mean, they, they had something like 50 kilowatt hour lithium ion batteries in them. <laughs> I mean, which is ridiculous. It would have been a sixty thousand dollar battery yeah. in in this minivan, and they're like, really? Uh-huh. Uh. <laughs> it, just hey, made good press. Just as an FYI, folks, we're actually going to be signing off here at 11 p.m. Eastern time. So we got about another five or ten minutes if there's But that doesn't mean that you guys can't still keep talking. We're going to leave the line open. Oh, okay. It's open line. Yeah. But like on Chrysler, I think the the vehicle that made them was that Grand Cherokee. That thing is just still phenomenal. The new one is extraordinary. The new one is just unbelievable. I remember back in – when I was in the dealer, we had a used one come in, and the Honda sales manager, of all people, had that thing. It took nine months to get that damn thing off of him so we could mm. sell it. It was amazing. The, uh, oh, the new know. Grand Cherokee, Automobile Magazine, I have a couple of friends over there, and their long-term Grand Cherokee, the brand new one, it's got like twenty five, thirty thousand 30,000 miles on it already, and the interior looks brand new. Right, and I bet you they, they, they'll hate to get rid of it when they, yeah. Yeah, they give it back. Love it. They absolutely love it, yeah. 
Well, it drives great. They're just. It is. I still wish that GMC uh, that'd be a perfect envoy or, or you know, they talk about the Cadillac Escalator, something something like that as a Cadillac yeah. would be. And the five seat, you know, the five passenger, like Bob was saying before, you know, Lutz was saying before, you know, you don't need seven passengers because half the people don't really carry seven people, you know. Yeah. Some people buy something that only carries five, so they don't have to carry everybody else's kids along or else. You know, Get a they, minivan. Yeah. When they pick their kid up from uh, soccer practice, they don't have to take, you know, half the neighborhood home with them. But, uh, yeah, exactly. minivans, too. Yeah, you know, I was at that CTSV event, and I was talking to uh, – What's the guy that did the CTSV, uh, uh, all the driving? With the, he's retired now. Heinrich C. Or? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, uh, that's his, one of his favorite vehicles. He, he has, a, I think he bought a minivan for his wife because, you know, it's, it's a perfect vehicle. You know, hate to say it. And, yeah, I still cannot figure out why GM doesn't have a, you know, bring back the Chevy Venture or, or the Astro. You cannot well, believe I, how I many think Astro I think vans. it was. The, the the Lambda the Lambda chassis was supposed to be minivan capable, but I think uh, Bob Lutz talks about it in his book briefly, or, or maybe it wasn't there, maybe it was some other interview he did. But the reason why Lambda never spawned a, a minivan because of, they wanted to Bob wanted to alter the hard points for right. the uh, for the for the for the for the Lambda SUVs. Right. Yeah, to make it more that wasn't going to happen. Yeah, to make it to make it more aggressive. So with that, yeah. by moving the hard point to not make it, you didn't want to make it look like the Honda Pilot, which he said all the pillars, the A, B, C pillars are very upright and they yes, look very yeah. straight, and it gives the car a very boxy look, very minivan look. He goes, he wanted he wanted the the, the Acadia, the Traverse, and the Enclave, uh, and the Outlook at the time wanted a more sporty, more aggressive look. So he changed the hard points on it, and once they did that, that killed. No. The minivan. That was a good so, like, move for the, Yeah, made the uh, yeah, Acadian that work. Those things do look. They do look good. They do. We should be seeing. I think uh, we should be. Uh, there, there are spy shots, but uh, we we should be posting up pictures hopefully in the next week or so of the Buick Enclave. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, because there there All is right. a market still for minivans. I mean, they sell about a hundred. There is. It's like a five hundred thousand oh, yeah. yeah, unit. I, I think, uh, yeah, I definitely think there, there's definitely a market there, but uh, GM has never really had any presence uh, or presence in that market. It's usually been Chrysler, I think, right. followed by Ford, and then GM's multi, uh, you know, the, GM's minivans are always too small, too tight, uh, right. too underpowered, not enough technology, didn't have enough stuff to, to, to match mm-hmm. uh, Toyota and Honda and Nissan falling out. Like, well, I, I think I, I with the, the Lambda, they got something. I mean, the next generation, I think they got something that, you know, that can, you know, they can get there from here, you know. I, you know, I, I, I think, love, I, the Lambda's drive, I think Lambda's drive a hell of a lot better than a minivan does. They have way more employees on the road. I think uh, I'm surprised GM hasn't or GM isn't pushing for a kind of a, a unibody rural drive oriented um, SUV to kind of replace the GMT 900 and and kind of go like with the Durango and the, the oh yeah Grand Cherokee went yeah the Not Durango having... and Grand Cherokee yeah to me you know you hey, have the second, Chevy Rick, Rick sure. I'm just interrupt you just for a second so I just want to wrap this up for Chelsea and um, Aaron and I because it's our time to go away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you guys are more than welcome to stay on. So I'm just going to do a little wrap up. It's Open Line, our monthly automotive get together. I'm Michelle Naranjo from Auto by Tell, joined by Chelsea Sexton from ChelseaSexton.com and Aaron Bregman from IHS. And we do this the first Tuesday of every month. We might be doing it the second Tuesday next month from NAIAS, but we will let you know. Um, if anybody wants to keep talking, please go to bit.ly forward slash open line. You can call in from there. The line is totally open. We'll leave it open until you guys stop talking. Thank you to our streaming partners tonight, GM Inside News, GM Authority, RumbleStrip.net, and DC Auto Geek. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast because you can go to bit.ly forward slash open podcast, or you can just go to iTunes and search for Open Line Show. And you can um, subscribe to the podcast because Ben will be putting up a pretty edited version of our little um, chat with Bob Lutz. And you can always uh, go to Stitcher and listen on your mobile phone or the web. And if you sign up through stitcher.com forward slash open line and use the promo code open line, you could win $100. 
Um, so you know, woo, just in time for the Christmas. Um, so <laughs> Two you guys, guys. thanks for me. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Another great show. I'll see you next month, okay? Thank Have you, everybody. Time. Have a good holiday, too. Have a good holiday and happy yeah, new year. Good night, Chelsea. Good night, Chelsea. Good night, Chelsea. Good night, Chelsea. Hey, guys. See you guys, see you guys in Detroit. See yep, you in see Detroit. You in Detroit.